Kathy Leiden Conway. I am a member of the Vision 2020 Dig uh, Diversity Task Group. We are the major sponsors of this evening's um, panel discussion, and we welcome all of you here. Um, this evening's discussion is about unequal justice. The panel is going to be talking about race and class um, in our criminal justice system. And that's our criminal justice system, all of ours. Before we get started, I want to make sure that you know where the restrooms are. The men's and the ladies, the ladies' room back here, and you have to go out the exit and then up a couple of stairs, men's on the other side. Um, those of us who have name tags on, are volunteers with a number of the different co-sponsor organizations. So if you have any questions, the volunteers can help you. Our program is going to be a moderated panel. After the uh, speakers all uh, do their speaking and their cross-referencing uh, and discussing with each other, there will be an opportunity to have questions from the floor. So if you're thinking of a question as it goes along, you, you might pay attention to that uh, and have your questions ready. But there will be plenty of time for uh, questions from the floor. We should be ending promptly at 9 o'clock, uh, at which time there will be books, references, uh, information, a lot of really good information for you on the uh, rolling bo board that's over here, on a resource table in the back, and books over on the, on the my left. Um, in your program booklet for this evening, on the front is the name of the panelists and all of our co-sponsors. Uh, on the back is the biographies of all of our panelists. In the inside is an amazing amount of information and resources that's available to you. So make sure you keep your program because you may want to refer to it at some other time. Um, because this is a collaborative effort, um, I would like to mention that we have 24 co-sponsors of tonight's event. I think that's a pretty amazing thing. Yes, yes. I would like to quickly read off those co-sponsors. They are also listed on a list on the rolling board and, and up back. Um, if anyone is here representing some of our co-sponsors, if when I mention them, if you would like to stand, feel free to do so. Um, all of them uh, are from Arlington, unless I note otherwise. So I'm going to quickly read the names of our co-sponsors. The Arlington Baha'i Community, the Board of Selectmen, our Human Rights Commission, the International Film Festival, and public schools. Calvary Church Methodist, Church Methodist United Methodist, excuse me, the Center for Jewish Life from Arlington and Belmont, Church of Our Savior, Drekong Meditation Center, the First Parish Unitarian Universalist Church, the High Rock Covenant Church, League of Women Voters, Mankind Project of New England, the Martin Luther King Birthday Observance Committee, the Mystic Valley Branch of the NAACP, Park Ave Congregational United Church of Christ, the Robbins Library, St. Agnes Parish, St. Athanasius the, Greek, the Great Greek Orthodox Church, St. Eulalia's Parish, St. John's Episcopal Church, St. Paul Evangelical Lutheran Church, Temple Amunia in Lexington, and Trinity Baptist Church. So all of these uh, organizations are working with us uh, and in a coalition of, of building a grassroots community around these issues. So I'd like to again say thank you. To all of them. I 
I hope you've been, been enjoying the food uh, that's in the back. Uh, feel free to get more of it as the evening goes on. Uh, many of our sponsors donated the food also, but the, we also got food from Foodlink, Quebrada, Stop and Shop, and Whole Foods, so a uh, thank you to them also. Um, one change to tonight's uh, program. Um, Peniel Joseph from Tufts University was supposed to be with us. We found out this afternoon that he is under the weather. So he sends his regrets, uh, but we have, instead of Peniel, we have our own Bonnie Bagchai Williamson, who is going to, his, has joined the panel in Peniel's place. So we're thrilled to have Bonnie with us. Um, to Bonnie's, Bonnie is a um, interim dean of students at Northern Essex Community College. Um, to Bonnie's right is our police chief, Fred Ryan. And to Fred's right is Frank Rudy Cooper, who is a professor of law at Suffolk Law. And on the other side, to Bonnie's left, is Don Perry. And Don is a uh, parolee and an activist working to change the criminal justice system from within. So um, uh, these, I'd like you to welcome all of our panelists. Moderating for us tonight is our, uh, again, our Arlington's own David Whitford. David is a journalist and writer, and he is cur currently editor at large for Inc. Magazine. He also moderates a number of our community conversations. So if you could welcome David. Well, thank you, Kathy. I want to thank the uh, Diversity Task Group for inviting me to moderate tonight. It's an honor to be here uh, and a privilege, and um, I'm uh, very happy to be doing this. Um, I also want to thank all our panelists for being here tonight, uh, for honoring us with your presence, and for participating in this important community conversation. Uh, we're very grateful uh, to have all of you here this evening. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you. It's such a wonderful thing to look out and see so many people in the crowd on a very cold Saturday night. Uh, and you're out here tonight to eat some vegetables, not dessert. It's, it speaks highly of uh, uh, our community, I think, that we can attract such a big crowd uh, to come tonight to talk about such an important uh, set of issues. There are three things I just want to note before we begin talking. Um, number one, uh, two days ago was the third anniversary of the death of Trayvon Martin. That was uh, not a police event and therefore perhaps not directly related to uh, our top, main topic of conversation tonight. Um, but uh, I think it, uh, it was clearly related to a chain of events and to a set of circumstances that brings us all here together tonight to talk about these issues. I just wanted to take note uh, of uh, that anniversary. I want to mention too that the focus in uh, conversations about race is often on the inherent uh, conflict, the us versus them. And I think we have an opportunity tonight to engage in a way that goes beyond simple conflict. And I hope we can all keep in mind how powerful it can be to talk about change together across race and class lines and to consider how together we can make things better. And finally, I wanted to make reference to uh, President Obama's speech on the evening of uh, Monday, November 24th, when uh, the St. Louis uh, County uh, uh, grand jury in St. Louis County failed to indict police officer Darren Wilson in the death of Michael Brown. He quoted Michael Brown's father, and this is Michael Brown's father speaking. Hurting others or destroying property is not the answer, no matter what the grand jury decides. I do not want my son's death to be in vain. I want it to lead to incredible change and positive change. So I think, I wanted to mention that because I think um, we owe uh, 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 a debt of gratitude 
to Michael Brown and his family for the sacrifice that they made that led in part to us having this conversation here tonight. All right, so let's begin. Uh, I'm sorry I have a cold. Uh, who doesn't have a cold? Yeah. <laughs> May I ask uh, the panelists, and um, uh, uh, let me uh, start with, um, with you, uh, Frank. I'm curious, I mentioned uh, the evening of Monday, uh, November 24th. And again, that was when the grand jury in St. Louis refused to return an indictment uh, for uh, police officer Darren Wilson in the death of Michael Brown. I'm curious, what was your personal reaction when sure. you heard that news? So I have to say uh, three reactions. Uh, the first was a lack of surprise. Uh, honestly, I didn't expect an indictment. Can you hear me? OK. My first reaction was a lack of surprise. Uh, this, as somebody who studies uh, policing and racial profiling and to a lesser degree some of the outcomes of uh, civil rights suits against police for misconduct, it came as no surprise to me that there was no indictment in the case. Uh, and then I sort of felt a sense of exhaustion that uh, in the context, as David has said, of Trayvon Martin and many, many, many other people being killed in ways that were very similar to or less similar to the way that Michael Brown was killed, uh, I just felt uh, maybe this is it. Maybe this is just the way it's going to be for the next decade or more. Uh, but then, uh, and when I saw the reaction, particularly the types of reactions like the Black Lives Matter campaign, I started to feel some rekindled hope. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Chief Ryan, I, I, I just want to mention that I asked uh, Chief Ryan before we began how he preferred to be addressed. And uh, to his credit, he wants this to be a, uh, an informal conversation here. So um, strange as it feels, I'm going to call you Fred. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call worse. <laughs> so uh, what was your response uh, to that news, uh, Fred? Like the professor, uh, I wasn't surprised. You know, we, we have an imperfect criminal justice system. Um, I, I'm not sure if my microphone is activated. There's no green light. Can you hear me now? Yeah. My apologies. Uh, like the professor, I, I, I too was not surprised. And we, we, we have an imperfect criminal justice system. Uh, our, our police officers and prosecutors go to court day in and day out with what we think are good cases, with good evidence, that get turned around um, and result in a, uh, a not guilty or, or a, a no, no bill, uh, non-indictment. And um, so in, the fact that that happens in cases where police brutality is alleged, um, I too was not surprised. Uh, that said, um, I, I think that the fact that communities uh, such as Arlington, um, and, and you know, this is amazing here on a Saturday night, um, that this is so important that we address the elephant in the room um, and, and have a good conversation about how we move forward in police race relations. There's no question. Um, the police have been flawed over, uh, historically at, um, at building trusting relationships in, in minority communities and with people of color. We've worked hard in Arlington to build those trusting relationships. The police department is only as good as a trusted community places in the, in the police department. And so, uh, again, I'm not surprised, um, but, I'm, but my surprise was, uh, uh, my lack of surprise was different than that of the professor in that I see people day in and day out who the evidence is abundantly clear they're guilty get found not guilty. It's an imperfect system that gives a benefit of the doubt to the defendant and police officers are entitled to those same rights that, that uh, non-police officers are entitled to. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie. Um, so yeah, I think it was the same sort of response, you know, just feeling not not feeling surprised and just feeling extremely depressed um, that not again, you know, once again. And, uh, but I think out of the depression, there was also this sense that, 
you know, it, enough is enough. It really, we really have to try to do whatever we can to get our voices heard. And I think as we saw the responses coming out, um, the whole point that struck, and I'm here I'm speaking for the diversity task group, that struck us was that, you know what, we do need to hear our, have our voices heard. We do need to stand in solidarity um, with our brothers and sisters of color. And so we did have a Black Lives Matter um, you know, vigil, which I think many of you came to. And um, it was in, you know, and the, we worked with the Arlington Police Department. And so I think that's what we're trying to do is work together to try to bring this information out there. We are in the information age. All the information is available on the internet and in library books. People just need to go out and check them or Google them. And there's tons of information about this. And so we hope that, you know, that is our hope, that people will get more information and then get mobilized and try to bring about change. Thank you, uh, Don. Uh, <clears throat> I was um, surprised, but not, but not so much surprised. I mean, and I think it was a, it was a very unfortunate tragedy. But to every, to every disadvantage, there's an advantage. And out of the <clears throat> recent incidents, I said to every disadvantage, there's an advantage. And um, out of all of the various, the recent incidents, one of the things that we've had to our advantage is social media where a lot of, there's a lot more transparency and that's what I'm grateful for. That a lot of these incidents, they're not just isolated, but they are being made public and so we can have an opportunity to really look at them and address them. Uh, thank you, Don. You've, actually, what you've done there is gone ahead and uh, begun to answer what my next question was going to be to all four of the panelists and that was, why do you think that this event in Ferguson had such a catalytic effect on American society, uh, led to uh, demonstrations, led to uh, community gatherings like ours. Surely what happened there was not a unique event, um, and I think we'll end up talking about other events like this and the history of these events and the sort of context for these events. So why did what happened in Ferguson, why, why was it different? Why was the impact different? I invite any of you who have uh, thoughts on that to respond. Well, I think the, the relationship between um, Ferguson's police department and the community was completely broken. Um, the, the police force didn't represent the demographic makeup of the community. There was no community policing. You know, I asked you to call me Fred tonight because I think I know everybody in this room on a first name basis. And it's so incredibly important uh, for, for a community's police department to be a part of the community to welcome um, accountability, to welcome uh, uh, criticism and constructive feedback, and, and to work with the community to, toward the collective public safety goal. And it appears, and I only know from what I've seen in the media, you know, so, but clearly there was a disconnect between the community and, and its police department uh, in Ferguson. Mm -hmm. And, um, and may I just add, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think this has happened in Ferguson. As a matter of fact, um, I've had the privilege of being a part of an eight-part justice documentary called The System by Joe Berlinger of Al Jazeera America. And one of the things, one of the issues is being addressed is so the system in and of itself is made to enforce laws and to hold people accountable. But the bottom line is who's watching the system. And <clears throat> in this eight-part justice documentary, it deals with every component of the criminal justice system, from false arrests to the, uh, the first episode is about false arrest, the ending episode is about prosecutorial misconduct. And, and each episode features two cases, one from around this country. So in, in that is emphasizes just how much accountability, transparency and accountability that needs to be made in the system. It indicates just how much, how many flaws or dysfunctional our criminal justice system has become. And we as citizens, we need to, instead of just living in a bubble, we need to start to paying attention and realizing just what's going on in our own community, never mind in the, in the other areas of the nation. Frank, you have Sorry, just one quick comment, which is I think that activists were really important in Ferguson as well. When I try and think about why did this happen, there was an insistence that this would be recognized and it was built up to that moment that people were expecting something to be done or there to be a reaction 
Um, the people may have been watching to see if there was going to be an explosion, um, but there was also, I think, a sense that people expected something to be done or there would be some kind of recriminations for the police department. Yes. Right. And I think one of the things that, I can't remember the exact numbers right now, but um, one of the things about Ferguson was that the percentage of uh, arrest warrants that were out for a population, you know, I'll just randomly, you can check it up out, but it's something like, let's say, if there were 43,000 uh, citizens of color there, you know, they're like 23,000 um, arrest warrants out there. And the question becomes really, do we really believe that three fourths of that population is uh, criminally inclined or, 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 you know, so it's a question of how punitive is the system, how much are, how much of the broken windows theory is being uh, implemented there, you know, how much stop and frisking is happening. So all these issues come out. So it was very disproportionate. And I think that's one of the reasons why the relationship was broken as, uh, uh, Fred was pointing out. So, and I think once that movement happened and that it got picked up by the media, it spread through the nation and suddenly people started realizing, really, there's something wrong about this. Uh, you know, they suddenly are sort of slapped in the face. They couldn't look away anymore. And I think that's what sort of, you know, injustice is injustice. And I think that suddenly uh, touched a vein. But to put some local context into it, um, last calendar year, over 1,200 firearms were seized from the street, streets in metropolitan Boston. Not one person was shot in, in those 1,200 seizures. Massachusetts and metropolitan Boston and the training of its police officers and the implementation of community policing is very different than Missouri. Mm -hmm. Thanks for adding that, and I, and I do want to get into that in more detail when we, uh, a little bit later in, in, in our conversation. But I wanted to step back for a second here and ask uh, Frank if you can give us some context uh, about the, sort of the state of incarceration uh, in America, the, the, the state of, uh, of, of law enforcement, how it relates to race and class. I, I think we all have uh, a, a pretty good uh, sense now that um, uh, the uh, criminal justice system nationally is, uh, is, 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 is an unequal system. But if you could help us uh, understand that uh, with some uh, uh, economic perspective, uh, that, that, that would be, I think, would help be very helpful to us. Great, thank you, David. Um, so the state of America with respect to incarceration is a state of hyper incarceration. And I mean that in the sense that we are hyper about it. We do a lot of it. Um, but I also want to uh, emphasize that it's targeted. It's very targeted. Uh, the United States uh, incarcerates racially a very disparate uh, portion of racial minorities. So specifically with respect to black men, uh, and also with respect to Latino men, there is uh, a ratio of, and I'm gonna look at a statistic here, so let me just see if I can get this close to right. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, Latinos who are maybe 18% of the population as uh, compared to about 60% for whites are about two and a half times as incarcerated as whites are. And then when you look at blacks, blacks are about two times as incarcerated as Latinos, which means about five times as incarcerated as whites. Blacks are roughly 12% of the population. So the disparities are there. Now, we'll have to have a conversation about why exactly that is so, uh, but I don't think we can talk about incarceration in the United States without saying that the United States incarcerates vastly more than any other Western country or even uh, non-Western countries that we might think aren't as civilized as we are when it comes to criminal justice. And so uh, the, the system is broken in terms of the amount of incarceration that we do. Uh, that could lead to a conversation about um, whether we over-criminalize. But then the second thing I think to talk about, it was already mentioned by Bonnie, is the stop and frisk and the sort of street level encounters that police officers have with civilians. And the stop and the frisk is basically the idea, and Fred can talk more about this, that a police officer can, with reasonable suspicion, uh, stop you, make you halt, 
And then if they have reason to believe that you might be armed, they can frisk you, which means to pat down the outside of your clothing. But the case that said that police officers can do this talks about feeling sensitively around the groin is part of a frisk. Um, and so it is, it is a, considered a minor intrusion under the Fourth Amendment, but in fact, it's quite uh, an indignity. So uh, those stops and frisks in the recent case of New York, uh, Floyd versus New York City Police Department, uh, sorry, City of New York, um, it was found that in New York City, again, with whites now only 33% of the population, uh, and uh, Latinos and blacks at uh, less than that, uh, whites were 10% of those stopped. African Americans, roughly 24% of the population, were 50% of those stopped, and about 30% of those stopped were Latinos, who were about 27% uh, of the population, perhaps. So at the sort of level of incarceration, there are disparities, and then at the level of street encounters, there are disparities in terms of who is targeted just to be suspect. So I don't know if you had other thoughts that you wanted to get out about that. Well, um, uh, somebody help me. Who, who's the former uh, chief of police in uh, New York City? I'm, I'm Bratton. <laughs> Bratton. Not Bratton. Uh, Kelly? Kelly? Ray Sorry. Kelly? Ray Kelly, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Ray Kelly became uh, uh, closely associated with this practice of uh, stop and frisk. Um, uh, the, the numbers were uh, off the charts um, um, under his uh, tenure as chief of police. Now, his, you, you mentioned we, we, we could have a conversation about why these numbers are d disproportionate. Ray Kelly's explanation is, look, um, violent crime generally happens, you know, between members of the, uh, among members of the same community. The perp and the victim are often members of the same community. And that in uh, uh, poor neighborhoods of New York City, in predominantly black neighborhoods of New York City, you have a disproportionate number of victims. And so it makes sense that we have a disproportionate number of stops. That's what Ray Kelly would argue. Uh, do you, either of you have it, any thoughts on that? Well, I'll defer to you, and I have some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, I have a friend who's a chief out in Milwaukee, and, and we've had some conversations uh, about this, and, and, and he follows a Ray Kelly model. You know, 80% um, of his um, uh, homicides are black on black. Mm -hmm. And so he says, who are we going to be focusing on to reduce our homicides? Um, black males. You know, I, I think sometimes that's a, a little too sim simplistic of an approach. And, and, and here's why. A lot of police actions are based on calls for service. You know, I'll give you an example. I was reading a report this morning. A restaurant here in Arlington Center called the police last night over a, um, uh, a woman of color who was coming in and sitting at the bar and using the Wi-Fi for free and not purchasing any food or, or beverages. And now, so our call takers are trained. We know that people that call the police have biases. They're human beings. So, you know, people aren't suspicious. Their behaviors are. And the dispatcher asked, you know, what exactly is the person doing that's suspicious that, that should rise to the level where there should be some police intervention? And so the business owner said, trespassing. This person's trespassing. I've asked her not to come here. She continues to come here. We want some police intervention. So we dispatch an officer, and the woman had left, left the, um, uh, the restaurant. The officer approached the woman, and of course, uh, the woman felt that she was being targeted because she was a person of color. And so we employ what's known as uh, a procedural justice. It's uh, a fancy term for people just want to know, they want to be treated fairly. They want to know why a police officer took the action they did. They want to be given the opportunity to ask questions around what the officer did and, um, and to have an effective, what we call disengagement. And so in this instance, the officer uh, explained and the woman was satisfied with the explanation and it turned out to be just fine. But my point is, is um, the overwhelming majority of, of police actions are, are call generated. And so if we've got people calling the police 
and, and, and furthering their own biases, we have to be more sophisticated in their response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess my response to Commissioner Kelly, sorry, go ahead. Take your applause. <laughs> uh, my response to Commissioner Te uh, Kelly, um, not to Fred Ryan, would just be that um, actually across the nation, about 5% of arrests are for violent acts, and about 8% are for property crimes. So everything else is something else. It could be uh, that somebody is suspected of having marijuana. Um, and in, the, in terms of the incarceration statistics, the people that are put in jail, particularly under Commissioner Kelly, um, are low-level drug offenders. And that's why I say, well, uh, maybe we have to think about whether it makes sense to incarcerate more than anybody else in the world based on low-level drug offenses. And most importantly, and I always have to say this, rates of drug use are equal across races. So it makes no sense that blacks are being brought in at five times the rate for drug crimes that whites are. Uh, Don, could I ask you now, um, it, while we're on this topic, uh, if you wouldn't mind talking to us about um, your sense of your relationship as a young man growing up. I don't know where you grew up, but uh, your sense of your relationship with law enforcement as a young man and whether or not that relationship with law enforcement, what that what was the nature of that relationship? Were cops your friends? Uh, were they people to be avoided? And how has that relationship changed as you've gotten older? Well, um, first of all, to answer your question, I was born in North Carolina. In North Carolina? I was born in North Carolina, yeah. Lewisburg, North Carolina. I spent most of my uh, uh, teen year, earlier teen years traveling from Massachusetts, New York, to North Carolina. Um, we, have, we, have no, we have no decision about what type of situation that we're born into. And unfortunately, I was born into a very dysfunctional family. And just like Frank mentioned earlier, he talked about the statistics of young black males being incarcerated. That generally, the general consistency is that one in every three black males will wind up in the criminal justice system. I am number one. And I remember at an early age reading the African American Encyclopedia and getting and come across these statistics, I was like, I was blown away, like, wow, like, I'm de I was destined for this. And, <clears throat> I mean, and it, you know, it just blew my mind. Why couldn't I have the same opportunities than anyone else? But the bottom line is, to get back to your question, Dave, early on in my community, the black community, now we have to realize something. In April, I'll be 61 years old. So, so we're talking 40, 45 years ago, things were like totally different. I mean, we're just, we're just uh, 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 coming into eras where, you know, that there was no, I mean, I've seen segregation. I've been to all black schools in, in the, the South. I've seen uh, Ku Klux Klan lynch lynchings. So when we talk about the police force, then the police force was to be feared and readily uh, suspected of not being treated fairly. So I grew up with that kind of like angst towards police officers, naturally so. As I, got, as I got older, experienced life more, got an education, bottom line, uh, I think one of the themes of, of the questions was, as far as this panel is like about how that there's a law, but then there's the application of the law. Do I think as a society that we need the law? Uh, do I, as a society, do we need policing? Yes. But I think as Fred mentioned earlier, it's about treating people fair, fairly, having transparency. And my, my overall experience has been, based on the color of my skin, when it comes to the criminal justice system, or any type of interaction 
with police, nine times out of 10, I'm gonna get, and anyone um, who has any type of history of, like mine is gonna get the short end of this stick. And that's just the way it go. We talk about people having those personal biases. I mean, just for someone to see that I have an arrest record, and I haven't committed a crime in over 30 years, but people feel like that they can, um, just looking at my record, they can give me their own form of justice for what for stuff that happened 30 years ago. And that's what it's, that's from, to me, that's the invisible violence. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, talking about community-wise, we have to, and the criminal justice system, is that caste system. Because no matter what I do, I'm always, when they pull my record, I'm always that 28-year-old that committed a robbery, was drug crazed, and wind up in Walpole State Prison for 18 years and seven months. It has not, it does not mention anything about what I have accomplished since my release. I've graduated college, I've created programs, I did all that. But when you, when they pull my record, W39865, That's what I have to say about it. Um, Frank, as a black man of a different generation, um, has your relation, has your relationship with law enforcement, how you, uh, how you interact, how you feel you're perceived, has that changed during your lifetime? Absolutely. So I'm 46, and I uh, graduated. Uh, I'm 46. I graduated from high school in 1986, and in 1986, I would say that I feared the police, that I um, didn't, I guess, I saw them as political enemies. Um, I wasn't involved in um, what gets thought of as major crimes, uh, so I drank underage. Uh, that so won't surprise I. a lot of people. Right. <laughs> that won't surprise a lot of people. We didn't drink together, though. Yeah. <laughs> but, when I was younger, I always thought I would be picked out as the person who they would say, aha, we see you drinking underage and that I would be brought into the system. And I knew that my white friends didn't fear that. Um, in one particular case, they almost got me in trouble because they felt very safe to drink in front of the police and I did not. Um, as I got older, I graduated out of that. Uh, there's definitely, in my mind, a sense that you get beyond about 30 or so and uh, people don't see you as uh, the threat that you were when you're younger. Um, that was my experience, and uh, as Don points out, uh, I did grow up sort of post-integration uh, and in Cambridge, so not exactly the hardest place to grow up. Um, and Bonnie, if we could talk about uh, the school system a little bit. Uh, uh, now, you're, uh, you're uh, as a professional, you are uh, a dean. Um, at, a community, at a community college, and I believe that you're involved uh, partly in discipline, right? Uh, it's one of your uh, functions. Um, I know that you and I have talked a little bit about what um, you refer to as the, uh, um, uh, what is it, the uh, school? Um, the school to prison. School to prison pipeline, yes. Um, and uh, um, I'm curious about your sense of how um, uh, uh, how, of how, how, the, how justice is unequally enforced um, in, in the context where you work professionally. Right. So, um, yeah, and I think that's, you know, anything that I'm going to say now, of course, I have to say that as a um, dean of students and currently, as well as in my past uh, experience, I was a dean of students also at a college where uh, it was primarily first generation students of color. And at Northern Essex, it is a Hispanic-serving institution, so it is, again, mostly students of color. And um, I think one of the things that, you know, as I talk about the school-to-prison pipeline, um, I think as the, the chief conduct officer at my college, I do understand the challenges and pain that school officials and school administrators face when they deal with students who are challenging, you know, who are breaking the law, or who are disruptive, etc. So I know that have I had to expel and suspend some students in the past? Yes. And those were all very painful and difficult decisions. So I do understand that. But I think what we're talking about is that there are situations 
that, for example, which are, you know, which are, you could say that, okay, they might be at a point where you do need to take a really stern disciplinary measure. So, you know, weapons, bringing weapons into uh, schools or things like that, which are what we call objective offenses, which are, you can see them on your drug possession in schools. Those are very clear offenses. It's not like, oh yes, you know, it's not a subjective thing. It's not based on your opinion. The kid has, the, has a weapon or doesn't have a weapon. He have, he's possessing drugs or he isn't possessing drugs. So those are a little more clear cut. And when it comes to white students, when we look at suspension rates, so basically suspension rates for black students is three times in the school system, and this I'm talking about K through 12, is three times that of a white student. The other groups that are, you know, so, so students of color, especially boys of color, are, are, are at greater risk. The other groups are, of course, students with disabilities, you know, and then the LGBT students. So I think the students with disabilities, again, my um, statistics, I don't have them in front of me, but I think it's at about 1.5, okay? And then black students are three times that of a white student. And this, re there has been research done, because the question comes up, then are, are students you know, of color committing crimes that are much more serious? But there has been research done, and what is happening is that for the same kind of offenses, students of color, are the, the sanctions put out against them are much more punitive. And so what happens is that um, for, for white students, they are often, their suspensions are usually tied to objective offenses. So that is again, as I was saying, possessing a weapon or something which is very clear cut. For students of color, it's typically, for most of the time, it's for what we call subjective offenses, which is things like, you know, somebody's being disruptive in class, or somebody's talking back to the teacher, or being disrespectful, you know, or for uh, using profane language, things like that. So things which maybe 20, 30 years ago would just, you know, you'd be sent to the principal's office and get a very stern talking to, now are, being, uh, are resulting in out of, out of school suspensions. And out of school suspensions have, are the number one predictor, much more than poverty, of whether a student is going to end up in the, having some interaction with the juvenile justice system. So what happens is that, especially once you're in middle and high school, once a student goes into out of school suspension, you know, for example, like let's take, you know, I'll just take for an example, if it's my kid, right? If he gets an out of school suspension, he has two parents with PhDs, okay, with terminal degrees. What are we gonna do? We're gonna contact the teachers, we're gonna get the homework, we're gonna figure out what he's missed, we're gonna spend a ton of time making sure that he's up to speed, so that when he goes back to school, he's up to speed. But what's happening with families where, you know, the children, the parents aren't at that level of education? And what happens is that once a student misses school, when he goes back, he's missed class hours. He's missed the learning. Now he goes back and he can't keep up. You know, he was already struggling before, so now he can't keep up. That leads to him repeating a grade. That finally leads to him dropping out. And finally, he's now in the juvenile justice system. So that's one way out of school suspensions work. The other is, of course, which is, you know, luckily we don't have it in our, uh, you know, in our um, school systems, but uh, in many other states, like so for example, if you take California, what's known as school resource officers, which is basically police officers in the schools. Once you have police officers in the school, if the tool is there, there is an immediate tendency to use it. So once you have it, there are students who are, you know, these are minor subjective offenses who are getting tickets from the police officers, from the school resource officers, and ending up in the juvenile just, justice system. In fact, you know, there was, uh, I think it was last year in Clayton County, Georgia, the prosecutors were so overwhelmed with these minor offenses that are leading to, uh, you know, cases in court, dealing with them, that finally they had to come up with a system where the school resource officers would be restricted in what they could arrest for. Denver, now, um, Colorado has passed a law restricting that for what kind of offenses students can be arrested. You know, so this is what, what happens is that so the, this out of school suspension is really problematic. And what, what, 
in fact, um, I think it was the US um, Department of Education said that 95% of out of school suspensions are for subjective offenses. Only 1.3% are for things like, you know, possessing an explosive device or a weapon. Okay. So like there's a student who was suspended because he chewed his pop tart into the shape of a gun, you know, which was I think in 2013. Okay. I mean, that's when you think like, what is going on? You know, there's a lack of common sense here. Okay. Um, also with the um, school to prison pipeline, once these students are in the system, you know, you're losing men. And, it's, and a lot of these students are already without parents. They're already without fathers. They're coming from a community where it's already broken. So we are just perpetuating this. The uh, National Education Association last year did take a resolution that they would try to stop this. You know, they would try to work towards this. And there's a lot of work being done in trying to figure out how school discipline can be changed. Um, I think I'll stop now and, you know, if okay. we come back to the topic, we'll talk Yeah, about thank it. you, Bonnie. Uh, Fred, I, I, I should know this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, having uh, had two children go through the Arlington Public Schools, um, but I don't know the answer to this. Are your officers uh, uh, present in, uh, in the school system on a routine basis? Yes, in fact, uh, uh, the officer that started our school resource, off uh, school resource officer program, uh, Brian Gallagher, is in the back of the room. And again, to put some local context in, and, and, and Bonnie and I have a, a, a great respect for one another, but I'm, I'm gonna disagree with Bonnie a little bit here. In Arlington, our criminal complaints and arrests on, on school properties went down as a result of the school resource officer program because when we implemented the program, we also implemented alternatives to the, criminal, uh, uh, to the traditional criminal justice program. We started a juvenile diversion program, which, uh, uh, were uh, mostly minor offenses that involved incidents that didn't have a victim involved. Uh, small amounts of uh, drugs, you know, uh, minor um, disturbances and, and things of that nature. And rather than seek a criminal complaint uh, and give the child a, a, as Dawn was mentioning, sort of that scarlet letter of having a, a criminal complaint on their record for the rest of their lives, we diverted them and put them into a setting where they had to get, you know, assuming it, it involved uh, drugs or alcohol, there had to be a, a, um, a substance abuse assessment, some community service, some therapy, whatever uh, um, the, con the contract was structured on a case-by-case -case basis. But the point is, the child wasn't put into juvenile court. The child was put into a, an alternative setting um, and still is targeted at, at, um, at the child succeeding. And Superintendent Bodio, I think is here tonight, uh, uh, fully supports that program and helps us fund it. In, in crimes that, uh, or offenses that involve a victim, we, we uh, partnered with the uh, um, Communities for Restorative Justice. I'm not sure uh, if, uh, those in the room are familiar with re the concept, concepts of restorative justice, but very uh, quickly, um, in, in the traditional criminal justice setting, it's, you know, who done it, who's the bad guy, and what's the penalty? Um, under restorative justice is, the question is, you know, uh, was, was there some harm, who caused the harm, and how do we repair the harm? And for those of you who have never sat in a restorative justice circle, or, or are not familiar with the restorative justice concepts, I strongly urge you to look into it. Uh, because it's incredible what can occur in the restorative justice setting. Uh, I, uh, in a neighboring town, a kid who put out all the windows at the five and dime, a felony, rather than put him into a juvenile court, they put him in a restorative circle with the victim present with the perpetrator. The victim was furious. He said, mom and pop shop, you put me out of business for the day. At the opening circle, it was hostile. They structured the contract, implemented the contract over three months, at the end of the three months, the guy that owned the five and dime hired the kid to work summers while he was in college. Kid does not have a felony record, graduated college, is doing well. That's what we need to be doing. And that's what we're doing in Arlington, thanks to Superintendent Bodie and others. Uh, Don, before we get any farther, I'd like to uh, give you an opportunity to, to tell us your story. Uh, you, you hinted at some aspects of it. Um, uh, it sounds like... Uh, 
I don't know if I was imagining this, but listening, watching you uh, uh, listen to uh, uh, Fred about that encounter with the criminal justice system, it, it seemed to me that uh, it, it, that you would have you would have preferred that kind of encounter earlier in your life. Um, totally. Tell us your story. <laughs> totally. Uh, I, I mean, I'm and I, I, I mentioned to Fred earlier that I, I had heard a, another panel that I did. I had heard with him speaking on another panel, and I'm really impressed about what's going on in Arlington, and especially under his watch. But um, so yeah, um, early on, if I'd have had that type of intervention to actually give me a chance to get on track to turn my life around, then there would have been, I'm sure things would have worked out different. But as the powers that be, I was taking down a different um, road. And the bottom line is, so in 1983, um, well, first of all, at 14 years old, I saw my father shoot my mother with a double barrel shotgun while she was nine months pregnant. No one has ever had a conversation with me about that other than me and my therapist. But the bottom line is that had a serious impact. And this was like, uh, this was after a long, um, up into that 14 years, my father used to beat me down on a regular basis. And after that incident, I vowed, we left from North Carolina, came back to Massachusetts, and I vowed like, no one would ever put their hands on me, or no one would ever tell me what to do again. So I am one of seven children that my family, that my mother and my father had. I took to the street at an early age. When we came back to Massachusetts, I immediately hit the street. 15 years old, I tried heroin for the first time. 15 and a half, I had my ha first heroin habit. My years of experimenting with drugs naturally led me to in, uh, engage in various forms of criminal activity. 1983, I was involved with some people that uh, we, we committed several robberies. One of the persons they really want, they wanted bad. I wouldn't cooperate with the district attorney. So for my taking responsibility for myself, June, excuse me, July 1983, I went into court. I pled guilty, taking responsibility for my action for the robberies that I committed. And they was trying to force me to cooperate and testify on another individual, and I wouldn't do that. Out of the charges, they said, allegedly said that one fell through the crack. November 1983, a week before this individual came to trial, they said I need to bring me back into court just for this one case. I was supposed to get a four to six year, I was all in July, I was given nine 25 to 40s, 18 to 20s, an array of different other sentences. They said it was just one case that fell through the crack the only thing they need, they wanted to dispose of it, have me come back in the court, and it was gonna give me a four to six year concurrent sentence. But instead, when I went into court, the district attorney, ex-district attorney, Francis Bloom of Hamden County, he stood up with a legal pad and started reading off information that was incriminating to the individual that he wanted, that he wanted my cor corroboration on. If I didn't challenge that, or if my lawyer didn't challenge that, it went into the record as being fact. So they could use that information to convict the person that they wanted me to testify against all along. I objected to that. As a, re as a result of that objection, I come out of that plea hearing where I was supposed to get a four to six year sentence with a second degree life sentence, the maximum penalty for armed robbery. And what did that mean in terms of, did they set out a parole uh, uh, schedule for you? At that, that? that, so what that essentially means is that I'm, uh, I'm on parole for the rest of my life at this point because I wouldn't cooperate. And this is what we're talking about, I mentioned earlier about the invisible violence. But even after serving 18 years, well, when I went into prison, the first nine years, I did just about whatever I wanted to do, regardless of the institutional rules of good conduct. I sold drugs, I smoked marijuana every day, I got in a couple of fights. But nine years down the road, I got transferred from Gardner, NCCI Gardner facility to Old Colony in Bridgewater behind a drug incident. I was transferred because I was labeled a leader of a drug ring. 
So when, on seven o'clock one morning, I found my, um, one winter morning, I found myself in the back of an unheated van with about 20 degrees in my boxers headed to Bridgewater. But when I got to Bridgewater, it had just opened and they had one of the best rehabilitative systems that I've ever seen. Education, therapy, vocation, all that. Maybe it was the timing of it. Maybe it's my level of maturity, but I dove right into it. I mean, I had had some prior college experience prior to being incarcerated. But I, wanted, at some, but I realized I wanted to establish a firm academic foundation. So I started on the pre-college level. I was there for like four or five years, and they wind up sending, I left there and went to Shirley Medium, where I enrolled at UMass Amherst Continuing Education Program. And in the course of that, I got involved with individual counseling, took advantage of almost every rehabilitative opportunity that was presented to me. 18 years and seven months later, well, first of all, it was 16 years. I went, I went before the parole board 16 years. And they didn't want to hear the, initially they didn't want to hear the model inmate. They thought I was scamming them. So I got a two-year setback to see if anything would happen. If I would change my uh, attitude or anything. 18 years and seven months, I got out. I went into a residential program, but based on my rehabilitative accomplishment, after I did, they made me do a crash course of learning everything about the residential program because they made me staff and staff office manager. And this is a program I was overseeing like 18 and 24 men in the, in the residential program. We all, they had a satellite women's program. And, we was, and I had to get people up 5.30 in the morning to sweep the entire streets of Northampton. And after I completed the program, they say that they would allow me to, that they would bring me on as staff. Other programs wanted me too, based on the thing, because in the course of running the program, I'm an advocate of higher education, all of the rehabilitative measures that people need academically, vocational, and psychosocially. So I implemented all these in these programs, and other people took notice of that and appreciate that. So he said, once you complete your six months stint in this program, we're gonna hire your staff. Harrison House wanted me, but what? I have a quarry. So based on their funding at that time, and we've heard all about the different issues with quarry reform that has happened over the years, so I couldn't get a job working in human service, but guess what? I got a job in a gun factory. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> so I got out in January 2000, completed a program in July, and it had been my dream. I remember I told you, I'm from rural Lewisburg, North Carolina. I had an eighth grade teacher tell me I would never graduate from college. I enrolled in, at UMass Amherst 2000, September 2000, seven, eight months after I had got out of prison. I had to do, and I had basically did all of my gen eds and stuff while incarcerated. I needed 15 new learn credits to March and May. February, I had an accident at the gun factory. I lost my left ring finger. But nothing on this planet was gonna deter me from wearing that cap and gown. <clears throat> so today, I had to report to you, Master, to pick up my cap and gown and my invitations. I went to, oh, I'm, I'm sure some people in this room are familiar with UMass campus. I went over by the W.B. Du Bois Library, by the Duck Pond sat by myself and cried like a baby because this is what I had accomplished. Everything <clears throat> that I have done since my initial release from prison has been about greater exploring and defining my own humanity, including helping to create other programs for pe and advocating for people that was also challenged. After I left the gun factory, I worked in shelters. 
from the shelters I went to. Uh, I'm one of the first persons in Massachusetts. As from the shelters, I was offered a job, and uh, I told the, the person that I had a, a quarry. So said, listen, you go apply for the job, and we'll see what happens. I went to three interviews. I was hired for the job. Two weeks later, the same person came and escorted me off the facility because I had a quarry. But I told him, I said, listen, if I, if I have the, the experience. Uh, Don, you want to just explain to the, all of us here about the quarry? Uh, what quarry, what criminal is? record of offender information. So, any, so and what, it, what it really means is <clears throat> anybody that's ever been arrested and arraigned in a court of law. It's that scarlet letter I spoke of earlier. Exactly. So if any, and this is why it's so important, like uh, Fred said, about keeping that off people's record. Because no matter what, all they got to do is just punch in your inform information and it comes up. And so <clears throat> the, the person uh, that escorted me off, I went that Monday morning to the main office and told him that I wanted to, uh, I was formally requesting for a quarry appeal. I was one of the first persons in Massachusetts to actually have a quarry appeal process through the Criminal History System Board. Eight months later, I got a phone call and I was offered the same job. I worked there for one year and left there and went and I started the single room occupancy outreach program, which you probably can refer to it as transitional housing. People live in efficiencies, all this kind of stuff. This is the forgotten population. People oftentimes think because someone has housing that they're fine, but they're not. They need, they need intervention. I mean, 60 to 80% of their income goes, to, they have fixed income. 60 to 80% of their income goes towards housing. So they need food. I had a food pantry. In and this was in Northampton. In addition to this program, I took over uh, the soup kitchen in, in Amherst, not bread alone soup kitchen. We, f we fed three hot meals a day. We're not talking about a soup kitchen where someone comes through a line and you dole out soup. This was restaurant setting, family setting, with plates mats on, on tables. And so this is the way that I contributed to my community. But as a result of doing this, I'm doing outreach. As a matter of fact, I had, before engaging in any of all this, I had to, to contact the Massachusetts Parole Board and get their permission to do any of this because I'm dealing with the unpredictable population of people. August 3rd, 2011, I was on my way to a board of directors meeting. I picked up an individual hitchhiking. Oh, he was on his way to a drop-in center where they go and have breakfast and shower in the morning and stuff. And we see them all the time. People have all of their belongings on them. It's not my business what this guy had. I'm just giving him a ride. Anybody that deals in outreach know that the objective is to meet an individual where he or she is. And the meeting him was simply about giving him a ride. Maybe later on I could have more conversation with him to figure out how I can help advocate for him. Bottom line, I didn't know that he was also being pursued by the police. He had stolen items and whatever else. To this day, I don't all know what he had. But it, when I was coming into Northampton, I guess uh, earlier we noticed a police presence. When I take the exit to Northampton, he bails out of my, out of my truck. <clears throat> I have to go through the light, I get pulled over. In the process, they find stolen stuff in my, in my truck, and immediately after my uh, plates and everything is ran, I'm a, Massachusetts, I'm a black man, Massachusetts parolee, and it just took a whole different meaning. Initially, the district attorney was even baffled about what he could try to charge me with. It took him late eight months to figure out, to come up with what well, we're just gonna charge him with. Uh, receiving stolen property because if it was in his vehicle, you can infer that, he, that it was his or he knew about it. I went, to, I went to trial. First of all, I had witnesses to prove that I was at home when this incident happened. I didn't do anything. Forensic evidence, footprints, and fingerprints, and everybody know mine, <laughs> <laughs> proved that I, didn't do, that I wasn't there. And I had a four-day trial the jury was out in less than two hours, and I was acquitted. But I was, instead of going home or returning to my life, I was returned to Walpole State Prison, where I stayed another 19 months. 
So not only did I stay a night, another 19 months, but <clears throat> ultimately, when I was released, and during this time, I mentioned earlier about Al Jazeera American and Joe Berlinger. They're talking about the, the issues about the system, and when they looked at parole, one of the things that happened was my girlfriend and a few other community members created an online petition to advocate for my release. They got 158,000 signatures. So when Al Jazeera America and Joe Berlinger and them are researching the issue of parole in Massachusetts, they're contacting Patty Garrett and a few other people in the state who are authorities on this issue. They said, this is a, not only is Massachusetts parole system messed up, but this is a prime example about how just messed up it is. So that's why that Joe Berlinger, Al Jazeera America featured me in their documentary. They made a comparison between uh, Connecticut parole system and Massachusetts parole system. Uh, Don, can you tell us um, something about uh, so what the universe of, of restrictions is that, that you have to deal with on a daily basis as a parolee? I mean, you, you will be a parolee for the rest of your life, is that? Or, well, or technically, have, is there any hope of escaping this? Technically, at this, uh, at this juncture, I am a second degree lifer on parole for armed robbery, right? And um, I'm currently uh, back, I'm currently filing a Rule 30 which is to vacate the dissenters. But from a technical pr perspective, I'm on parole for, my, for life. But let me, let, me just, let me just back up a minute, sure. David, because one of the things, so the 19 months that I was incarcerated, I'm totally blown away because I have worked almost 30 years to turn my life around. Every day, Every hour, I'm sitting in Walpole saying, like, how can this be happening to me, man? And then people were talking about, well, you know, the parole board, since the Dominic Sinelli thing, they've all but Josh Walls all but eliminated parole in Massachusetts. And I'm saying, well, listen, once I get in front of that parole board, I don't care if they're a panel of Nazi German, uh, generals. They're going to have to turn me loose because I haven't done anything. The bottom line is, once Josh Wall did is he okay? Yeah, the officer's calling an ambulance. I'm so sorry. That's, that's fine. That's fine. It's okay. That's fine. Oh, that's fine. Is, is he okay? He's okay? Do you want to? Yeah, let's we'll see. Okay. Go ahead, Don. So, but, so, but uh, the uh, thing of it is, so once uh, the former chairman, Josh Wall, was interviewed by Joe Berlinger of the system, what he said was, I don't know what Mr. Perry did, but I know he did something. Ultimately, when I got out, I've been, as a matter of fact, I've been, uh, the 20th this month will, will, is a, a year that I've been back out on parole. June of last year, Josh Wall was nominated for a judgeship. I'm sure people in this room, have, some people have heard about the opposition, the dimensional opposition that, that he had to his judgeship not only for almost eliminating parole in the state of Massachusetts, but also for antics that he pulled as a district attorney. Antics such as um, obst obstructing the same justice that he was supposed to be providing. But the bottom line is, after, being, after having, uh, this, was the, this was unprecedented, that any, anyone that's ever been uh, nominated for a judgeship to have the kind of opposition that they did from the criminal, from criminal lawyers, community le leaders, prisoner advocates, and everything. Ultimately, October 3rd, Josh Wall admitted publicly that he had me locked up for 19 months without even reading the court transcripts or anything to consider the relevant facts about that I shouldn't have been locked up. And his justification was, but eventually I let him go. So not only did he cost me 19 months of my life, I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to catch up on bills and everything too, but even as uh, individual taxpayers, he cost the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and just in my situation alone, over $100,000 that it can ill afford based on a whim. So when I talk about the, inv the invisible violence and the uh, transparency and holding people accountable, this is where I'm coming from. And one of the things, I, you know, in my entire experience of the Massachusetts, of being on parole, 
once I was released from prison, I thought, I bought into the notion of the system of meritocracy. That if I rehabilitate myself, rehabilitation is supposed to be progressive. If I keep doing the right thing, I'm gonna build a life for myself. But I know like any minute, right, right now someone could say I did something and I'm right back in, back in prison. So I think that we, that's one of the reasons why I've created a, pro, a project called Operation, Project Operation Change to Antiquated and Abusive Policies of the Massachusetts Parole System. This is a statewide initiative. This is, this is a statewide initiative to make parole, to change the cultural biases of parole and make it the rehabilitative uh, process that it should be. Parole is not about, at this stage, parole is not about advocating for people, it's about policing people. And there's the one dimensional identity. I've done everything possible on parole, but to them, I'm just a parolee. And so, I hope that answered you. No, thank answer you very question. much, Don. And I appreciate hearing your story. And uh, um, I don't know if the other people in the room know this, but Don came a long way tonight to uh, share his story with us. Uh, thank you uh, for making that effort. <laughs> You know, there's many aspects of that that are very powerful. Um, one of the, the things that was most meaningful to me was to hear you tell the story of your two different incarceration experiences. The first place where it was all about punishment and where you actually made, uh, you, you went backwards, not forwards. You get transferred to another prison where they have a different way of, of, uh, of thinking about the prison experience and they have opportunities for rehabilitation and you blossom under those circumstances. So that suggests to me that not just only in, uh, at, at the incarceration phase, but at the policing phase also, there are better ways to, there are better practices. I was struck by uh, uh, President Obama in his speech, uh, again on that night uh, of uh, Ferguson, um, where he talked about, um, uh, seemed to suggest that the, that the problem of, of uh, unfair policing is not unsolvable that there are uh, techniques and best practices that can, be, that can be learned and that could go a long way towards solving some of the problems that we talk about here around unequal justice. Uh, the good news, he said, is we know there are things we can do to help. So my question for the panelists, anybody who wants to address this, uh, uh, Fred, I'm particularly interested in what you might have to say about this, and Frank as well, but anybody. Um, to what extent, to, if we accept, for the sake of argument, that there is a problem of unequal justice in the way the law is enforced, how much of that is a solvable problem involving best practices and the adoption of new techniques, some of which you've already talked about with us, Fred, and how much of that is a much deeper social, cultural, historical problem that we're not going to solve in our generation? You know, I think you touched on it uh, earlier, you know, about the us against them and, and uh, everybody digging their heels in. I think the first step is, is to uh, recognize that from a macro level and from a policy level, um, some change needs to occur. And, and I, I always like to cite the example, Bonnie's heard this before, others may have heard it. In the mid-1980s, I was taught uh, by a program sponsored by the United States Department of Justice, how to racially profile as a young cop. I was taught how to do it. It was under this uh, highway drug and addiction program. And, and so that was by the United States Department of Justice. Um, and, and so we need to, and I'm sure there, there's other policy and trainings that are going on that, that, that um, fly in the face of common sense. And so, um, I'm happy to see Representative Garbley came in tonight because one of my frustrations in, in these discussions is oftentimes lawmakers are, are absent. And there may be others here tonight that I haven't seen, but I know Rep Garbley is here. Thank you, Representative Garbley. And, and we need to get our lawmakers engaged. We've got a bill on, on Beacon Hill, Rep Garbley, on, on restorative justice we talked about earlier uh, before you came in. I hope you support that, that bill. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. 
So, um, you know, engaging lawmakers, looking at policy, and, and really, you know, the, the other thing is, just briefly, um, you know, we did a training with our Arlington offices, uh, and, and we worked with the Human Rights Commission and others in, in the community. Where we, we went over to the Widow, Widow Robbins house on a Saturday, and um, we hired a facilitator. And long story short is we hire from the human race, and we recognize that our offices come to their profession with biases because of their own upbringing and, and background. And, and, um, and so we, we, in a safe way, allowed them to talk about their upbringing and what biases they may bring to the job. And we, we, we were able to give them tools on how to check their biases when they're making an enforcement decision. Uh, one example is an officer you know, admitted, geez, I see somebody covered in tattoos. I automatically think the guy's bad. And so we flushed that out for a while and talked about and helped them realize why it really isn't, it isn't the case. But now that officer, when, when he engages in his law enforcement duties, was given tools and was able to, in a safe, in a safe place, talk about his biases. Because the problem is, is, is as soon as somebody says, yeah, geez, I've got this bias, they're labeled a bigot or, or a racist or this or that. You know, and we've got to stop the name calling and, and the us against them, as, as you talked about, and be able to have mature conversations about where we're going to go next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So I think just a little bit to follow up from what uh, Fred said, um, you know, this whole bias situation, I mean, I think what I want to clarify a little bit more about that is that, yes, there are biases that we are aware of, and then there are biases that we're completely unaware of. And that is what's known as implicit bias, or implicit race bias. And, um, you know, um, Mazarin Banerjee has done a lot of work on that, and she's come up with a test that way you can just go on the computer and take the implicit bias test. And it's very interesting how even people who consider themselves pretty liberal and, you know, and people like us, when they take the test, it's no, you know, it's, I don't know how many, most of you might have read Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, so it's that Blink response, that between seeing something and reacting, you really haven't had time to process it, but it's an automatic response. And that's what they've done in the implicit bias test, is that you, just, you take the test and they, they throw words at you, for example. So like, let's say they throw good and bad out, and then they have a ton of words out there and as you're associating. And it's very interesting that usually the concept of being black is associated with be, in the negative way. So these are the implicit bi biases, and that's, I think, what happens very often. It's not that people are, you know, a lot of people are not necessarily trying to be racist, so to say, but these are just built in. And that we have to be so much more con conscious of it. And that's why I think it's in all our systems, whether it's the workplace, and you know, as um, Fred was mentioning, in the police departments, but also in school systems, it's really important that there be tremendous, this kind of cultural competency training, so that people can really understand their biases and see how they're reacting. And again, to go back to my favorite topic of school to prison pipeline, I mean, in uh, uh, you know, 2009 to 10, there were three million out of school suspensions and 92,000 arrests. And 18% of the preschool children, we're talking about four and five year olds here, you know, 18% of that are blacks and they comprise for almost half of the students who are out, put in out of school suspensions. So it's, it's really, you know, when you're putting four and five year olds in out of school suspensions, there's something wrong there. So I think, again, to go back to what, what Fred is talking about, restorative justice, some schools have started this. And, you know, like, for example, they have the circle keeper system. They have the, so when students are tardy or they're late, you know, how do we bring them into the system and keep them in school instead of giving them punitive punishments? You know, instead of just racking those up and then finally saying, okay, you've been tardy six times or whatever it is, and let's, you know, we have to suspend you, instead of going into other methods that, for example, Fred was mentioning about community service, you know, programs where they can actually maybe stay in school 
you know, and still learn. Because what happens with out-of-school suspensions often is children will just pretend that they were suspended, you know, that they were sick, they were homesick. And a lot of kids, believe me, are extremely happy that they're getting to stay, to stay at, school, at home. So in a way, it's an incentive rather than a deterrent for a lot of kids. It is, in fact, if one is trying to send a message out to other students that this behavior will not be tolerated and you really want to, and if, I'm not, and if a school system wants to go down a shaming path, the better thing is to do, do is to do in-school suspension where other students can see that, that, hey, the student is an in-school suspension if you, really, if you really want to go down a punitive path. But the main thing is how much learning is being lost and how to bring these students into circles and you know, so how to change our system from one of being punitive and at every level, whether that's the police level or the school levels or in any level, you know, college levels, anything, um, to being one of a culture of compassion and empathy and holding students responsible, but in ways that are restorative, that are empathy-based, that are based in things like community service, and so they're still held accountable. You're not putting them off the hook, but you're not sending them a very drastic line. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I, I want to uh, just give an endorsement to uh, this uh, 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 implicit bias uh, test. Uh, Bonnie was telling me about it today. Uh, it's easy to find if you Google implicit bias, um, and uh, the tests are very interesting and will tell you things about yourself that may not make you feel great about yourself. It's, uh, <laughs> but I highly recommend going through it. You'll learn a lot. Um, I want to get to questions from the audience in just a moment, but I, I want to give uh, uh, Frank a, a, an opportunity to respond to uh, that question. How much is it about, uh, how, mu how much, how far can we go by implementing best practices, as some of which we've heard a lot about tonight, and how much of it is a deeper rooted uh, social and historical cultural racial problem? So I think that it's a deep rooted social problem for the most part that techniques are important and I certainly applaud what's happening in Arlington and, and what I know of what's happening in Cambridge. But we have to realize these are Arlington and Cambridge. And um, the people from the human race that are being hired are coming from everywhere. And uh, the people in Arlington and Cambridge still have implicit biases. So the technique can only help as much as it is uh, changing some behaviors that people would otherwise uh, not do. Um, let me put it another way. Um, we all have biases, and given that we all have biases, I don't know that a technique can stop you from your uh, instant blink response uh, unless it has truly become ingrained. I hope that these techniques, like the procedural justice, help change people from faking it sometimes to actually making it, but I worry that we'd have to change a lot more in the entire culture because that officer or that school teacher goes home and sees the local news, and we know that local news is um, a primary source of implicit bias. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now, I, I think we have a couple of microphones uh, circulating in the audience, is that correct? Yes, here in the yellow sweater, um, uh, we want this to be, oh, and over on this side of the room as well. Um, uh, this is uh, a, not just a panel discussion, but a public conversation. And uh, this is the point in the program yeah, where uh, I'd like to invite uh, any of you to address uh, any questions you like to any of our panelists. Um, here we go. Start here. Thank you. I have a question. Um, you know, it would be, maybe be helpful and, uh, to uh, tell us just a little bit about uh, your name and, and who you are. And yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks. My name is Anne Emmerich. I'm a member of Temple Shiatikva in Winchester. Um, I'm also a psychiatrist at Mass General. I have a question about kind of the opposite direction from what you're talking about. Um, I wonder when police officers um, do the kind of work you're talking about, that great work about talking about biases, whether they talk about um, how often they give a pass to people because of white privilege. Um, so I have a, a sort of a personal anecdote. My husband loves astronomy and he was out in the yard one night with his telescope and a neighbor walking by thought he was a burglar and called the police. The lights were off because he was out looking at the stars. The police came and as soon as he said it was his home, they left. <laughs> and shortly thereafter, Professor Gates 
was stopped in Harvard, you know, in Harvard Square in his home. But it made me think about what if he wasn't my husband? They never asked for proof of who he was. They never asked if they could see his wife. Um, and I was, you know, I've thought about that a lot. Um, so I just, that's my question, sort of the opposite of what you were talking about. But. You know, if I could add, just add one small thing to that question. Uh, that brings up sort of the issue of discretion. Uh, officer's discretion at, at the point of contact. Um, and uh, I'm curious about what role that plays. Yeah, uh, again, uh, getting back to a comment I made earlier, uh, we try to train, and I will, I will point out while Rep Gobbley's in the room that um, uh, Massachusetts is uh, the fifth from the bottom in terms of funding per capita for police officers in America, believe it or not. Uh, our, our training um, for police officers is woefully underfunded. In Arlington, we use alternative uh, funding sources, but that, that's not true outside of the Cambridges and the Arlingtons throughout the Commonwealth. Um, uh, so, but my point is, is uh, you know, behaviors. We, we, we train on uh, people's behaviors are what results in the reasonable suspicion of the probable cause, not their gender, not their race, not their uh, um, status in society or anything else. It's their behaviors, and so if we if we get officers to focus on what is the behavior the person's engaging in that rises to the level that it's suspicious or reasonable suspicion, or probable cause, then an officer can take an action. So, um, and and again, we do that also with our call takers. So that incident you referenced was probably somebody phoned that in, probably, as a suspicious person. Well, our call takers are trained. Um, that, that's not, that doesn't rise to the level of police engagement or, or, or a police response. What is suspicious about the person? Oh, he's, you know, climbing up a ladder in the back window and hauling out a widescreen TV. Okay, <laughs> you know, we're going we're gonna to send, we're going to send the police officer. But just the presence of a person in the backyard, we're going to, we're, you know, we're, we're cautiously going to approach a, a call for service like that. And it gets back to uh, training, Rep. Gobbley. Training, 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 which we have no money for. So I, I think it's great that you raised the idea of privilege because uh, all of us probably in this room in various ways have privileges, uh, and especially along lines of, for me, being a male, regardless of whether I may uh, face other challenges as a black male, um, there are benefits that accrue to me regardless of whether I request them and which will continue to operate in my favor unless I do something to affirmatively disgorge them. Um, and there are lots of examples of that. I think for my life as a professor, I think about the fact that uh, the female professors uh, who are also on my faculty face greater challenges with authority in the classroom. And it's not because our students at Suffolk are any more prejudiced than any other students when it comes to gender. It's just that they assume authority more for a male than for a female. So what does that mean for this type of situation? I think what it means is the appropriate thing to do, which probably would seem awkward, is to sort of say, well, why are you just letting me go? <laughs> um, and, and I think it could be, and there's been some talk of this because of an episode of This American Life, and it could be something that actually saves an officer to not walk into the room, eyeball the black male, and say, that's the threat here, uh, when it could be a threat that's somebody else, and that we've sort of given the person who may, in fact, be the danger, the privilege of not being suspicious without thinking about it. Thank you for that question. Well, personally, I, I think that uh, sealing record is a myth. And the reason why I say that is, be is because that, I mean, you know, the internet is the information highway. And people don't realize that, say, I could be applying for a job here in Arlington, and, and when they, when uh, a job or even housing, they have, so, they would have their own insurance companies. The, the insurance companies would have their own uh, criminal record companies that would research. So I might be applying for a job in Arlington. The insurance company got a quarry uh, a research company out in Arkansas or, or somewhere that all of this is public information that you can access. So when people go through that process, that arduous process of supposedly sealing their record, 
then ultimately, what does that, that, that mean? So one agency has, de has dealt with it, but there's got billions of other sources where that's gonna pop up. My thing is, what I always say to, say to people is, go through an actual formal quarry appeal with the Criminal History System Board. Anytime you're applying for a job or a housing, look what that, what that process is, to, because they have a, each one has an appeal process, and you need to legitimately go through that process at least once. Because once you go through it, okay, for the first, the first time that I went through the process to get hired, it took me eight months. The next time that I applied for a job, it took less than 45 minutes for them to deal with the, the Corey appeal process because I had already gone through the process once. I had all of the, the information and everything compiled and all I had to do was present it to them for the sake of uh, con convenience, like here it is. And, and so this is what people need to do. And, one of the main obstacles, and I'm just gonna add this, that people need to overcome with that is the shame. First of all, they need to know what's in their, their record. They need to not be shamed by it. I mean, quick question, by a show of hands, how many people in this room have ever did something wrong? Come on. <laughs> Today? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, and so, but in that instance, what people, you know, you paid the consequences and you moved on with your life and I think this is what people need to do in those situations that has any kind of history, to just move on, to come to terms with it and move on. Thank you, Don. That reminds me of uh, something my father used to always say. He, uh, I made a mistake once, he used to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Neil Osborne. Thanks. Who wants to take that? Uh. Well, I think I'd like to add to that a little bit, and that is about also, um, you know, I'll leave the law enforcement bit to the expert here, but uh, expert. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's more about also getting, you know, people of color in all kinds of positions, not just law enforcement, but in positions in the town, in uh, you know, in selectman positions, in uh, town meeting members, all those things. In, in the schools, in, in the classrooms, as well as having students. I mean, I think one of the things about our town is that we are a predominantly white town. And having, you know, it's really important that we have students of color in our classrooms. And we do have the Metco program, which many of you know of, uh, but that is a critical, a 
critical, critical program in our school systems. Even though the numbers are small, it would be much better if the numbers were much higher, but it's really important to have that. And that I say about, and what is interesting is when you look at the research, it is the benefits of having a diverse classroom accrue more to white students than to students of color. And while what I mean by benefits are things like uh, increase in cognitive com complexity, um, increase in, um, you know, just, just all the learning outcomes are much higher for white students than for students of color. Because what happens with students of color often, there's been, and I'm sure, um, uh, you know, Frank would uh, be able to talk to you, but there was a study done of, uh, for example, um, Harvard and Michigan and all the top law schools. And what they found in those law schools is that the students who were students of color had already had a lot of interaction with people of other races prior to coming to law school. The white students in those law schools had had extremely segregated upbringings. And this was the first time in a lot, in, in, being at university was the first time when they were actually meeting um, students of color. And why is that important? Because when you look at things like constitutional law and those kind of things, it changes the nature of a classroom because different racial groups have different opinions about vital things like capital punishment. And so it's really important that right from the school levels, the elementary school levels, we try to make our classrooms more and more diverse because the population is changing. By 2050, whites will be a minority. You know, it's the single largest minority, but still a minority. And our children need to be able to function in that world. Um, thank you. Uh, maybe, Fred, maybe you can take this question now. And, and, and uh, I, I mean, I, there's his part, uh, the questioner's part about uh, how we can encourage more uh, young people to be get interested in careers in law enforcement. Right. I'm also curious about how you make hiring decisions in Arlington. How much do you think about racial diversity? How much do you think about um, long-standing relationships with the community? Do you have quotas? How do you, how do you hire? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, and that's another frustration of mine, and I'm glad we have uh, some, some state reps in the room. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to have a job tonight if I keep uh, beating up on these guys. But, uh, I, have, I have a little to no discretion on um, the demographic background of the people that we hire as police officers. Um, under Massachusetts civil service law, uh, we have to go by a list that results from a multiple choice exam. Uh, the, the hiring system is flawed. The hiring system is broken. Uh, we have had a stated goal to, uh, I mean, you know, nobody's going to be able to convince me that having a more diverse police department wouldn't be a valuable thing in any community, particularly in Arlington. So because we're handcuffed by the hiring process, largely driven by unions, um, I have to go and get creative. I mean, we can't use that as a crutch. So what I do is I go out to the community colleges. In fact, I think I'm at Bunker Hill on April, April 2nd, I think. And um, I go to the criminal justice programs in the community colleges. Uh, and, and I also go to Middlesex. You know, Arlington kids generally go to Bunker Hill or Middles Middlesex. And I give a presentation on, on taking the civil service exam and, um, and how to succeed. And, and it's a PowerPoint and how to, how to prepare yourself for the exam. I, I was, uh, last year I was giving that, and a young man came up to me and introduced himself after the class. He was a, a, a young man of color, and um, uh, he lives in Arlington. He said, oh, Chief, I want to meet you. My name, I don't recall his name. We shook hands, and maybe I had a blink, a blink response, but I said, where do you live in town? And I could see him sort of, his body language, and he said, well, I live in the projects. And, and he. And I said, well, I grew up in the projects on 96 Fremont Street. And I saw him light up. So he said, my chief grew up in the projects. So my point is, is um, we try to get creative to get around this civil service system and recruit kids that want to be police officers and, and take the exam and help them succeed in the exam. That said, we should have far more discretion in hiring our police officers than we do in Massachusetts. It's a shame. And that's one change I hope will come about from these meetings. Well, I'm going to applaud that. <laughs> <laughs>
But um, there's a case which you probably heard about because it's associated with uh, Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor, uh, the Rishi case out of Connecticut where um, they tried to throw out the firefighter exam because it wasn't producing a diverse uh, firefighting force. And um, I think it raised something that um, Fred has talked about as being important that we really need a sort of multi-component system in all facets of life if we are to find the people who will be best for that particular environment and given the context of who's already in that environment. Um, so I would agree that if we want to have diverse police forces and police forces with um, a variety of skills, then we have to think about changing our methods of hire from a straight up test, which we already know sort of demographically what it's gonna produce, to other things that might be more important, like if you meet somebody from the community and they demonstrate that they would be a good police officer in terms of how they interact with people in that community, that should count for something. Agreed. Uh, who's next? Another question. Right here. I, I don't see the person Hi. asking the question. Right oh, here. Hi. Oh, got it. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. I'm Andrea James uh, from uh, Families for Justice as Healing. We're an organization based out of Roxbury that is comprised of formerly incarcerated women, and we use our voice to create change here in Massachusetts, primarily to raise public awareness about the need to reduce the incarceration population of women. And before I thank the panel, I just want to thank Representative Dave Rogers, who I just saw, it's over there. Uh, Rep Rogers is a co-sponsor of a bill that is near and dear to us called the Primary Caretaker Bill that's just been uh, filed here in Massachusetts that would create an alternative to incarceration for primary caretakers of dependent children. <clears throat> and um, I'd like to say thank you to Dawn for sharing your story and um, ask if you could make some recommendations. We have members, um, but I'm thinking of one in particular who also sits on our board. Uh, Tina Williams has been on parole for 40 years in the state of Massachusetts. And Tina is a remarkable woman who has helped hundreds upon hundreds of women and has just recently um, left on the rise, but was, was at on the rise for many, many, many years in Cambridge. Uh, uh, an amazing, phenomenal woman, and um, is still, um, her, 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 the petition that we did for her uh, was overlooked uh, by the last governor who just left office. How do we um, ask for and engage communities such as this one in helping us in our endeavors to move people off of parole in Massachusetts who clearly demonstrate, such as yourself, that they should not uh, have to endure that in a continued incarceration any longer? Well, uh, I think uh, that one of the first obstacles is to overcome, like you said earlier, about raising awareness and educating people about what the, uh, what the current state of Massachusetts parole system is. We've spent two decades, 2000, 2001, the Boston Bar Association uh, created a task force to do research about the issues regarding the, mass the state of the Massachusetts parole system. They made five recommendations, including what you're talking about, like commutations and pardons and stuff. 10 years later, none of those five recommendations was implemented. The Governor's Council or similar another uh, panel of people to do two years research. They recently, in 2012, they submitted what is, you can go online and see it, what is called the white papers. The white papers included those five recommendations and also added a couple more, including, as you mentioned, rehabilitative incentives. As of today, none of those recommendations have been implemented. That right there is one of the primary objectives 
of project operation change to change the antiquated policies and abusive practices of the Massachusetts parole system. This, as I said earlier, this is a statewide initiative. I'll be coming through all Arlington and doing um, some different event to raise people awareness and help people get support because ultimately we want to um, inspire our local officials, our legislative officials to enforce, I mean, we talked earlier about what laws, what policies are already written. We've already just spent two decades of doing research about this. Now let's just do it. Because this is, it, it is having a devastating effect on people's lives. And even for, again, Joe Public, that feels like that this doesn't have anything to do with him. But the bottom line is very simple. It costs less to supervise someone on parole where they're paying $80 a month than for you to be paying $45,000 a month to house them in an institution. So this is, we need to talk, but this is what needs to be done. We need to, re, we need to really address the issues statewide of the Massachusetts parole system. Uh, what can we do? And what are the benefits? How does diversity in the classroom affect um, uh, educational outcomes? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think um, one of the things is, I think Superintendent Bodhi is here, so I mean, I don't want to speak for her, <laughs> but uh, so if she wants to speak, that's fine. I mean, I think we could let her talk a little bit because the school system has been working. They do have a um, superintendent's uh, diversity advisory group, and we meet with uh, the superintendent once a month and come up with ideas. And um, so I don't know if Superintendent Bodhi would like to speak, or do you want me to sort of say what I think? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, you lied, okay. All right, so I think um, one of the things is that um, as far as in our meetings with uh, the school system, I think one of the things that we've uh, found is that uh, the pay for teachers that the Arlington school system offers does not compete with some of the other areas. And Superintendent Bodhi can, of course, correct if I'm, uh, you know, what, if what I'm saying is uh, mistaken. But for example, the Boston Public Schools pay much more. And it's, uh, so one, one thing is, of course, I think, I think that's a factor. So in, in order to attract teachers, of course, maybe, you know, pay is an important factor. Um, I think one of the things, though, is that it's not just, just about attracting teachers. Um, and this I'm going to just talk from the research out there, that when there, there are certain factors. For example, when you have teachers of color, they are much more comfortable teaching diversity in the classroom. And typically white teacher, uh, sorry, but typically women teachers are more comfortable, like among white populations, to talk about diversity than men. You know, there are certain subjects that are more prone towards bringing in diversity as a topic, for example, you know, the liberal arts, of course, than, for example, the hard sciences. But um, again, you know, there are some small examples, and some of you might, might have heard this before, but for example, in the school systems, some of the ways to include diversity, even if we can't include the teachers, for example, one is, of course, the student population, you know, um, if we can, to make sure that the medical program lasts, that there's funding for it, because there's supposed to be more budget cuts, you know, not on, on the state level. And so those programs are there. And that medical, prog medical programs really work at integrating students, you know. Those are some of the things. There has to be a critical cohort. Otherwise, if you just have a few students in there, they are going to just suffer from minority stressors. They become, they feel like they're the token, you know, black student in the classroom. There has to be a cohort so that they can actually succeed and flourish. Um, that's one of the things. Another ways to incre incre increase diversity would be things like little changes. For example, in a math program, you know, let's say at the third grade, and, I, and I've used this example before, but instead of Frank giving Jane, Frank has five apples and he gives Jane two, if we use, you know, Jamila gives Ali two. The names really matter. I know it sounds superficial, but there has been research done, and um, I think it's, his name is Mulyanathan, and he was a social scientist at Chicago, and he did a research where they sent out 150 resumes which were identical in every way. The only thing that was different was the name. 
The callbacks for the standard, what we consider the norm, white names were much higher than those for you know, what are considered as typically black or diverse names. So I think this is where, again, that implicit bias works in. So right from the school system and from early on, we have to make these changes. Uh, for example, in Darlington Public Schools in the third grade, at least in my kid's school, my kid goes to Dallin, they have a biography project where a student chooses somebody and then presents, you know, reads about it, writes about it, or acts it out or something like that. And in, for both my children, you know, they were encouraged and they chose people of color. So my daughter chose Harriet Tubman. My son, when he was in third grade, chose Frederick Douglass. But that is because we are encouraging him at, at home to do that. The other students chose wonderful people. I mean, Alexander Graham Bell, you know, wonderful people. They're all people worth knowing about. But the question is, if the teacher just puts a small thing which says, choose somebody from a different race or a different culture than yours, immediately the classroom will be flooded with role models from different races and different cultures. This is what changes minds. So even if we can't change the fact that, there is a, that we don't have a teacher of color there, we can change the mindset of the students a lot. And I think as far as teachers of color, it's not just about hiring them. You know, of course, there has to be much, much more outreach, which the school system is trying to do, reaching out more to colleges which are training teachers of color, you know, targeted sort of recruitment, but also committees. The hiring committees, again, and this is research that's done, that hiring committees will not hire a person who is different from them. Because people are just, again, it's implicit bias. They're just more comfortable with people who are like them, unless there's a mandate, unless they've been instructed to do so. Therefore, when at college levels, when faculty committees hire, they have to be instructed. Otherwise, they will hire what they're, fami what they're familiar and comfortable with. How are resumes weighted? You know, for example, if there are two comparable candidates, you know, does the fact that one is a diverse ca candidate and has diverse experiences, does that matter? For example, in the Harvard admission process, that has become a factor, you know, you, can, you cannot do sort of race-based, but what is it is, di do they bring diverse experiences? So for example, if the class is looking mostly urban students, they might, they might admit a student who's from rural Idaho because they have a diverse experience and because it enriches the classroom interaction. You know, so I, I think these are all many ways in which we can try to diversify our children's education. And again, as far as teachers are concerned, targeted recruiting, um, you know, changing the nature of the committees that are doing the hiring, instructing the committees to really sort of not just, you know, okay, please consider diversity, but really making them understand, training the teachers in implicit bias and making them understand the value the learning outcomes for students, for white students especially, when there's a diverse classroom, all those things will matter, you know, it might change the mind of who is being hired. Um, and then, of course, after the hiring, there's the retention. You can't just hire people of color who come in and start suffering from minority stressors, where they feel like if they really speak up about what they, how they feel and what they think, they're going to be regarded as playing the race card, you know. So you really have to have that kind of environment also after that. Thanks Thank very you. much. I just wanted, sorry to cut you off. I just, we have about uh, five minutes yes. left. Can we get, I think we have time for two more questions uh, uh, that would oh. be uh, uh, answered can I, can I, succinctly. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yes. I will take just one minute. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, Kathleen Bodie, Superintendent of Schools. Uh, this is a, this was a very appropriate and good question. This is something that we are focusing on. It has been a district goal. Um, we uh, one of the things we do is we actively recruit. We have a coffee for possible applicants, uh, uh, invite them from minority fairs. Uh, from we have sponsored those kinds of um, um, hiring job fairs at the Arlington High School, but it is. Um, in general, there is not a large pool of candidates. And one of the things, the step that we have taken in the district is to be one of several communities that have begun a program called Today's 
uh, Students Tomorrow's Teachers. And this is a program that begins in ninth grade and helps students um, develop their uh, skills and interest in entering the field of, uh, of education with the idea that at some point they may come back to this community or to another community as a teacher. So it is something that we, I don't want you to think that it's something that we do not focus on. It is something that we have a laser light on right now. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Bodie, just one quick question. Uh, do you uh, face, do you have any more freedom uh, uh, in, in your hiring decisions than uh, Chief Ryan does, or are you under the same kinds of restrictions? No, we don't, we don't have the same restrictions with respect to civil service. We have other constraints, and one of which is uh, certification um, for a particular position. But no, we do not. But you face the same challenge we have in terms of retention. You know, we border Cambridge and Boston, and you know, to, to the extent we've had some success at recruiting and hiring minorities, for good reason, they look to go to higher paying professions in Cambridge and Boston. We've experienced that, I think. I, uh, on the absolutely. In fact, it, many years ago, I worked both at Simmons and Harvard, and that was actually an, an issue. A lot of the students of color. Um, did not want to work in um, suburbs that were, were more white. They would choose um, positions in Cambridge or Boston because of one of the things that Bonnie was talking about, and that is um, being part of a, a, a group of colleagues uh, that have a similar background and, and um, race. So yes, it is an issue. It is an issue. We have had coffees to try to um, uh, bring people of color from uh, all of our schools together. Um, and those have been quasi-successful. They've happened a couple times a year. But it is an issue. It is a big issue. I failed to mention, and, and uh, with the help of our legislative delegation, Rep. Rogers, Gobley, and Senator Donnelly, we've been able to get uh, uh, Department of Mental Health funding to have a mental health clinician on staff in the police department under what we call the co-responder model. When we, when we went back and analyzed incidents of use of force, the overwhelming majority of, of cases involving police use of force, uh, the uh, person who had force uh, used against them, um, there was some either mental health or substance abuse issues going on. So now we have a co-responder uh, mental health clinician who's, um, and I thought we'd get a lot of pushback from the officers, you know, oh, you know, a psychologist in the police car with, now, it's, it's the most rewarding program we've ever implemented. I hear the radio, I heard it tonight on the way here. Is the clinician available? We need the clin clinician here. So as a result of that program, our arrests have gone down. And so while we have to explain that to the finance committee, you know, you know they say, oh, arrests are down, we need few, fewer cops. <laughs> no, arrests have gone down by design. We don't need fewer cops. We, we want our arrests to go down. If we could have, the crime rate stay the way it is and have zero arrests, we'd be happy with that as a police department. And so, and so it's so critically important, and, and our uh, Health and Human Services uh, Director, Christine Bongiorno, uh, works in partnership with the police department. It is a true, legitimate partnership. But that program, um, uh, to our legislative uh, folks that are here tonight, we've got to sustain the funding for that. It's, it's been phenomenally uh, successful at driving down not only driving down arrests, driving down incidents of use of force. We review our use of force every January. We review the prior. Every, every incident gets broken down. What happened here? And we were seeing mental health, substance abuse, mental health, substance abuse. And that's when we implemented that program. So thank, thank you for reminding me of that, Joe. So thanks very much. Um, I just want to point out, uh, we are going to close now. We're about uh, four minutes past 9 o'clock, and we should finish on time. Um, we have, uh, there might still be some food left in the back. I know that there is a, a reading list for people who want to uh, learn more about the topics we've been discussing tonight. And uh, I, my, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you buy the books on the reading list at the Arlington Book Rack, you'll get a 30% discount and support a local bookseller. My deep thanks to the, our panelists, to, uh, to Frank, to Fred, to Bonnie, and to Don, thank you for your professional experience, your personal experience, taking time out on a Saturday night. Deeply appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you.